Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just letting you guys know I'm putting you all on mute, uh, not because we don't want to hear your lovely voices, but we want to make sure that you can hear us and everything that we're saying. Uh, we are so excited to be starting up our virtual tastings again. We took a little bit of a hiatus on the jacuzzi side. So I think it's been about three months since we have done a virtual wine tasting. So really, really happy to be back and see some new faces. And uh, we are really, really excited. Um, we want this to be super fun. So if you guys have any questions, make sure to use the chat feature. I'm gonna be looking at the little chat box the entire time and we'll all kind of keep an eye on it. So if you have any questions, please let us know. We will get to them, pose them to either Tom or Jesse or myself and answer everything. And with that, uh, I wanna say happy early Valentine's Day. And we have a great lineup of wines for you to try today. We kind of chose them in the theme of Valentine's Day. And we'll talk through each of those wines. We have our Rosato di Primitivo, our new Dolcetto, our 2020 Dolcetto, as well as our Valeriano. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, I want to quickly introduce myself and then the two other hosts of today's virtual tasting. Um, so quickly, I am Megan Klein. I'm part of the second generation at both Klein and Jacuzzi Family Vineyards. I've been working with my family for the past six years now, uh, doing a little bit of everything from working in the vineyards, in the winery with Tom, uh, in the marketing department, you name it. Uh, it's really the best thing about working for a family is that no two days are ever the same. So that definitely keeps things interesting and fun. And um, it's been great. And we're also here with our winemaker, Tom Gendel. He has been our winemaker for the past three years now. Is that right, yeah, Tom? Uh, I guess uh, 2019 is when it took over. 19, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so two years. And Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and everything yeah, so, you do? So I'm the winemaker jacuzzi. Started that in 19, as Megan said. Um, I'm from New Zealand. And uh, sorry if I talk too fast. As I drink more, I just <laughs> end up talking faster and faster and faster. Um, but I'll try to stay slow today. Um, I've got my degree in winemaking and viticulture in New Zealand, and I worked there a little bit. I spent six months in Germany working there too, and um, worked in Napa and uh, Sonoma, a variety of wineries and stuff. Um, got a great experience in the vineyard and winery, and um, really loved coming to Jacuzzi and making the wines. We met, got so many cool, interesting varietals, and it was really, really fun to kind of sit down and um, dissect them and think about how we wanted all these wines to be made and shown. And it was a real it's a blast making these wines now. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And then uh, a special guest who hasn't joined us before on one of our virtual tastings, but we are so excited he's here, is our wine club manager, who a lot of you have probably talked to, uh, Jesse. So Jesse, I would love to hear your background and if you could say hi to everyone. Yeah, hi, you guys. How's everybody doing? Good? Thumbs up. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I started getting um, into the wine industry about almost 15 years ago. Um, when I first moved here to California from Idaho, I found an interest in wine and I started to frequent a wine bar in Old Town Sacramento. And I made friends with the manager there. And, um, you know, slowly, when the recession hit, you know, I decided I needed to change my career and he talked me in to start working in the wine bar. And I said, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just went with that. And I really found a fascination with wine and the interaction with people. I love talking to people. So um, from there, I went and started working, um, ironically enough, at an Italian winery up in the foothills, <laughs> um, up in Amador County, and um, the ABA is known as Shenandoah Valley. And so I worked there for a few years and then came to Napa and kind of been around a couple places. And luckily enough, I found Jacuzzi a couple years ago, and I, I love it. And I love everybody there. And I love my wine club members. 
Well, we love having Je Jesse. It's been so fun working with you. Um, all right. So with that, I think we can kind of jump into the good stuff and talk a little bit about the wines that we're going to be trying today. Um, the very first one is our Rosato di Primitivo. This is the 2019 um, in the old label. And I, we will talk a little bit about our new labels uh, here in a second. But Tom, I would love to just have you talk a little bit about the 2019 Primitivo and kind of get us started. Yeah. Um, look. Yeah, so the Rosato di Primitivo comes from um, grapes we farm down in Contra Costa. Um, so we gr grow this specifically for our rosé wine. Um, it's a little, it's a, the vines are about 30 years old, 30 or 40 years old, a uh, beautiful cropping as well. Um, Primitivo does really well in Contra Costa because they're all head trained vines. And so as the clusters get heavier, so basically the shoots kind of sprawl everywhere. It's the California, you know, Medusa head style vines. And as the, um, bunches get heavier, as the berries get bigger, um, what happens is the, the shoots start drooping down and then you get really good scattered light sunlight onto the top of the bunches for nice even ripening. And um, this we picked, we picked the wine at around about 22 bricks. It was picked on the 23rd of August. Um, gives us a nice light alcohol. Um, we destem it and put it straight into press and um, get that wonderful, really nice bright pink color. Um, gorgeous color, I really like the, uh, the look of this wine. Um, we do pretty simple winemaking on it because we want to keep that fresh flavor, those nice strawberries and cherries and that watermelon ca characteristic, that juicy Jolly Rancher almost. And um, just really light and elegant and refreshing. Um, we put it into a tank. It, uh, we use a natural yeast on this. It just kind of starts fermenting. We keep it nice and cool, like 55, 60 degrees in a stainless steel tank. And then once it's finished fermenting, we rack it off nice and clean. And um, about two or three months later, we filter it and put it in a bottle for you guys. And um, just really nice, elegant wine. Very refreshing, crisp, easy drinking. Um, great on Valentine's Day. It's great with um, cheeses and stuff like that. And uh, or pastas or light kind of lunch dishes as well. Um, really fun wine to drink. We really enjoyed drinking this. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And so you said we picked this earlier. How much earlier do we pick this in relation to, say, our still red wine Primitivo? Uh, like three or four weeks earlier. Yeah, so we're definitely picking it. So um, in winemaking terms, we the general rule is um, you grab uh, bricks is, our, is how we measure sugar. It's a, an approximation of how much sugar is in the grape. And that's important because that means um, how much alcohol you're going to have in the end wine. Um, the wines usually pick up during the ripening season about a brick a week, give or take. If it's a really hot week, you can see up to two bricks. Um, a normal week, one brick, a cold week, it might not move much at all. So yeah, we normally pick our still Primitivo at about 25, 26 bricks. And so that takes like three to four weeks to get up to that kind of ripeness. By doing that, by picking it earlier, you just get that um, much fresher fruit and you get that really nice bright watermelon characteristic. And because we're not getting all the extraction out of the skins, we're not worried about tannin or anything like that. We pick our still wines, um, our uh, red wines a little bit riper because we've got that skin contact and you want to get that tannin a little bit riper and juicier and a bit more um, darker flavor. Um, whereas a Primitivo Rosé, you pick it a bit earlier to keep that freshness in it. Yeah. yeah, and I think the freshness really comes through. I love the acidity on this wine. It's just super juicy. I think you said watermelon Jolly Rancher, and that is my absolute favorite description of this wine. It is like eating a Jolly Rancher. Uh, do you, what do you think about the wine, Jesse? I kind of focus on the, like, the strawberry cream side of it. Um, I definitely just really love this wine. Um, early on, it's so fruity um, and I really like fruity wines, but sometimes people will say fruity wines come across sweet. <laughs> um, um, I, so I kind of like when it's softened, the, the strong fruit. So it's just yeah. a little bit more dry and I, I find it perfect with, with some cheese. I would definitely have some cheese with this wine. Yeah, I, um, yeah. oh, and things, I feel like I should, sorry, go ahead. Uh, one of the key things, especially in white wines and rosé, it's all about that acidity and kind of that mouthwatering is kind of what we're going for, where you kind of have to go back for that extra sip, you know, and that's, you know, the bottle's gone really quickly and that's kind of, yeah, what we, how we like to drink our wines. Yes, and I, uh, I realize I should share my screen because we have a great slide on our uh, Rosato di Primitivo and 
we have all of these recipes, both the uh, fish tacos and this farro salad that are up on our website. And um, this picture down in the right hand corner, these are actually a lot of the immigrants from when these original vines were planted out in Contra Costa County, where this is from. Um, you know, there's such an amazing history out there. And especially for Jacuzzi, we have quite a long history out in the area. That's where my great grandfather, Valeriano, uh, had a ranch, had vineyards, and that's where my dad learned all about making wine and growing grapes. So it definitely has a special place in our hearts. We love all of the wines that are coming out of that area. And I think it's really starting to get a little bit more recognition as well, because these old vines are so incredible. I mean, you can see in this bottom right hand corner uh, what those vines look like, and they still look exactly the same today. It's pretty amazing. And I would love to kind of open it up to you guys. If you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the chat. Would love to know what you think. If you guys get watermelon, Jolly Rancher, strawberries and cream, what are your thoughts? Um, and Jesse, you said you'd pair this with cheese. What kind of cheese is your like go-to rosé? Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, a sucker for like the um the the breakfast cheese mm. um that one is always amazing uh, megan's always great at keeping that one in the fridge there's always one of those to go to um i also am a big fan of brie oh yeah me too always <laughs> yeah. i have some allison Payne. hi allison <laughs> um she said brie as well <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and someone said, Deb and Dan said, definitely Jolly Rancher, delicious, but not overly sweet. And Tom, totally a testament to you. You're an awesome winemaker. I think uh, it's the perfect balance. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to make these wines. And like you said, the vineyards are just a, such a great resource. Um, you know, some of those vines out there are over 100 years old. They're dry farm, they're low intervention, um, just fantastic, fantastic vineyard to work with. And when the fruit comes in, it just makes it really, really easy to make bright, really kind of vibrant wines that really show their distinct place and their distinct flavor profiles. Um, yeah, it just makes makes the job really easy when you work with good fruit. Oh my, God. and okay, also shout out to Megan uh, Webster because I feel like I've talked to you a million times, but it's great to see her face. Um, and yeah, she gets watermelon Jolly Rancher too, so. That's great. And Tom, can you quickly talk about 2019 as a vintage and what it was like? 2019 was really nice. Um, it was a great vintage, um, kind of a winemaker's vintage because um, so we had fairly like a reasonable summer, um, consistent summer. We had good water and stuff. And so we were able to irrigate. We didn't have any pressures like that. And there was really no kind of um, nothing too crazy. I mean, I think we had some we had some fires close by and we had some power outages, but that wasn't, didn't affect us at the winery or the grapes either. So we were lucky about that. But um, the temperatures were kind of pretty mild through harvest. And so um, when you don't have big heat spikes or rain problems or anything like that, you've got a lot of time to make your pick decisions. Um, you're not rushing around to get everything in the, in the winery before a heat wave or before a rain or anything like that. So you get this nice big, great window um, where you can kind of really just take your time and relax and enjoy the harvest and um, make good decisions. Um, yeah, so it was just a really kind of mild, fantastic, easygoing vintage. It was um, actually a really delight. It was really fun making wines in 2019. Um, we'll talk about the other vintages, the two other vintages, because they were not quite as much fun as 1919. Was um, the three wines we've got are the eight, we've got a 19, a 2020, and a 2018, and they were all very different harvests. Yeah. So um, 19 was fantastic. Yeah, that's great because Brent is actually asking us to compare it to previous years. And I guess you'll talk about the different years, but how about in terms of the Rosado in previous years? Say like, how, how is the 2020 tasting? And I, I think the 20, uh, the 2020 is awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. 2020, um, I think, well, the 19, it's, I haven't tried the 19 for a couple of months and it's tasting delicious. I love all the fruit coming off it. It's not showing any age or anything like that. It's still fresh and vibrant and delicious. Uh, the 2020 we've bottled, um, that's really fantastic too. Um, I don't think it's tasting quite as good at this yet. So get this while you can, because this is tasting really delicious. The 2020, um, a little bit younger. Um, I don't think it has that, it doesn't have as much of that watermelon jelly rancher characteristic. And it's a little bit more strawberries and cream. 2020 was a lot hotter vintage. Um, 
for example, I don't know exactly when we picked the Rosato for 2020, but I think it was along the week, along the lines of the first week of August. So around about the 7th to 10th of August was the date. Um, this wine, the 2019, we picked on the 23rd of August for a reference. So two oh. more weeks of hang time, get a little bit more flavor development, get a little bit more kind of characteristic in the wine with that longer hang time. So um, yeah, 2020 was a lot hotter vintage. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to the Dolcetto, but yeah, um, very different vintages. Nice. Okay, I just have to say, uh, Norm and Tia said, one, this is a great hot tub wine. Completely agree. <laughs> Might need to try that out a little bit later. Um, but, you know, it's so funny because I was just complaining about how freezing it was here in Sonoma, but it's about 60 degrees. And I know that you guys are having like a massive snowstorm up in the Northwest. So I feel like I can't exactly complain. Um, anyway, with that, I think we can jump to our second wine, which I'm really excited about you guys. This is actually my favorite wine now that we make at Jacuzzi. Um, and it's, it's so delicious. I love that we changed up the style. This is actually one of our first 2020 wines. It is our 2020 Dolcetto. And quickly just wanna, um, I'll share my screen and, you know, show you a little bit um, one, where we're getting this one from, but also talk a little bit about where our inspiration came from, because we, like Tom said, we sat down when Tom became the winemaker back in 2019, and we went through each individual wine, and we were really talking about how we're going to differentiate them, what kind of style we want to make each of these wines in. So we actually look back to Italy and how they're making Dolcetto in Italy. Um, Dolcetto is typically found in the northern region, in the Piedmont, Piedmont region, uh, and it is the lesser known, least probably least exciting red wine in the region because that's where the big Barolos and Barbarescos come from, but it's also home to Barberas and all three of those versions of wine, the Nebbiolo and the Barbera, have a little bit more street cred than your Dolcetto. But the winemakers and the vineyard owners actually really like Dolcetto because it's something that doesn't have to age as long and something that they can release a little bit earlier to get people interested in the wine. So we kind of took that and we were like, it sparked this interest in us to be like, well, why don't we kind of do the same thing, treat it almost like a nouveau wine and make it really early, don't age it super long, just release it as this really fresh, bright, vibrant red wine that is super easy to drink. So that was really the inspiration behind this new style of Dolcetto. And I think, Tom, you like hit the nail on the head with this one. It really does have so much vibrancy and great tension. And like, it's a wine that you can drink on its own. Um, we, we recommend serving it a little bit chilled because um, it really like brings out a lot of that like floral note and the raspberry, um, but you can also pair it with food. I just, I think it's such a versatile, like fun wine. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the the process. Yeah, so this is this was a really cool wine. This one's like one of the ones we gave a really big overhaul, which was a lot of fun. Um, like Megan said, what we did um, was we sat down with a few different Dolcettos. They're not easy to find either, but we found a few different ones and kind of researched the styles, did some background research on how these wines are made over in Italy. And um, kind of the focus for, um, for Jacuzzi, what we all kind of agreed on was we want to make awesome Italian wines, but also with um, with respect to Italy, but also with that California twist, like because uh, we've got so much fresh fruit characters here, and we've got all this flavor that abounds here. So um, that was our kind of um, overview overview um, of how we wanted to make the wines. And so this one, we kind of wanted to make it. Uh, we took some inspiration from France, Beaujolais, um, and also kind of like a rosé. And so what we did is we picked this a little bit earlier as well. It gets picked at about twenty three bricks, twenty three to twenty four bricks. We bring it into the winery. We treat it like a red wine at first, um, but it only spends about five days on skin. So very, very short maceration. Um, we get it fermenting straight away. So um, immediately starts fermenting. We keep the temperature quite cold because um, we want to keep all that fresh fruit character in. Um, and uh, that's kind of the real key to this wine is that fresh fruit. And it really is fresh, if you know what I mean. Like it tastes like that fruit is in the glass. And um, 
So we press it early at about 10 bricks, so about halfway through the fermentation is when we press it. And um, then we let it finish fermentation. And from then on, we basically treat it like a white wine. Um, we don't let it go through malolactic fermentation, so the acidity is brighter and more vibrant. Um, it gets basically, after it's finished fermenting, we put it in barrels for only about two months before we bottle it. We bottled this wine, so it's a 2020 wine. It was bottled in January, so it only spent about three months in the cellar. It's a very, very quick turnaround, and we want to keep all that kind of freshness. The longer you leave it in the cellar, the more it kind of turns into, for lack of a better word, more whiny, if you know what I mean, more red wine um, for <laughs> bit of description, whereas this wine is kind of really special because it is that really fresh, vibrant characters, characters are coming through that, you know, it does smell like cherries, like literally a glass of cherries and raspberries and stuff like that. So really fun wine to make, um, different kind of style from everything else we want to make. And we wanted to delineate that out as well and make sure every wine was different and was respectful of where it was from in Italy, but also tasted really different in our lineups. And um, I think this wine's awesome. We like drinking it a lot. It's not for everybody. My mother-in-law hasn't figured it out yet. I don't know quite what that means, but um, <laughs> she she struggles with this, but we love drinking this. This is great before before dinner as you're having snacks and stuff like that. And then if you've got, it's even great with dinner as well. I Like Megan said, I like to keep this chilled as well. I just pulled mine out of the fridge because um, I like it just kind of at that, I don't know, almost like 30, uh, yeah, 40 degrees or so. Yeah, 40, 45 degrees nearly. Yeah. yeah. Jesse, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, did you come on when we had our old style of dolcetto? Yeah, so um, when I first started working, um, I believe it was the 2014 dolcetto. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you know, everybody has their preference in wine and that one was my least favorite wine <laughs> that we had. Um, and it just, it, for me, it was just that, that style. It was a little bit of the heavier style of a dolcetto. And so it just wasn't for me. Um, and then once we did the 19, I was like, this is amazing. And um, the 19 dolcetto will always have a special place in my heart because um, that was actually, we had a um, kind of like a special event for the release of the 19 dolcetto. And it was at the beginning, um, it was the beginning of March of last year. It was and March it was, 7th. I will never forget this either. Yes, yes. So um, it was so much fun. <laughs> Got to see a bunch of wine club members, have a great time. Um, and then literally just a couple days later, we were closed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, me and the 19 Dolcetto hung out at home often. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this one is just, you know, I feel like um, Tom took the 19 and just even perfected it even more and this is amazing wine again I really like strawberry and um like that's a fruit that I always find it um in wines and um this one kind of has like a little bit of that fresh strawberry to it um absolutely I totally agree Jesse I you know those like wild tiny strawberries that you find sometimes that are oh like, yeah the little baby ones uh, yeah. but they're so good this is exactly what it tastes like to me yeah um and yeah, I, I do, you still get a little bit of tannin, but they're so smooth and it's just like juicy. I feel like that's such a good word for this wine. It's so yes. juicy. So in, in the winemaking process, that's why we press it off at 10 bricks. So um, what happens is tannins come from the skins. Um, and so we're trying to avoid tannin extraction in this wine. We want it to be low tannin, acid driven, a little bit of phenolics and structure and things, but no, very little tannin is kind of our goal. And so what happens is during fermentation, once you get to about 10 bricks, um, then you start extracting tannin. You, um, what happens is the alcohol actually breaks down the molecules inside the skin and so that they become um, ab absorbed into the wine. And so um, by pressing it early, we stop that tannin um, extraction, but we get all of this wonderful fresh fruit. And um, we kind of stop the wine from evolving too far. We want to keep it like it's almost like grape juice um, straight out of the vat kind of thing. So how long do you keep the, um, the juice in with the skins then because you can't do it for a long time right yeah so um, it depends so the 19 was a little bit troublesome uh, the, the reason why the 19 and 20 are different is the 19 came in freezing cold and when you've got a big oh. tank of grapes and they're really cold they don't ferment as quickly um and so they take a little bit longer so but we learned from that in 2020 i told them hey don't pick the grapes in the night pick them in the day so that when they come to us they're warm and they can start fermenting immediately and so we got shorter skin contact on the 2020 than the 2019 um, but basically 10 bricks halfway through fermentation is when we press because from then on you do start extracting some of those kind of more tannins more structured more, more, more structured 
uh, chemical compounds. So um, yeah, it's basically based on how far the ferment's going. It's not really a time. Um, we want it to be as short as possible, um, but we've got to get to that kind of halfway ferment uh, point before we can press it. So Tom, I have a question and um, yeah. I, what do you think about aging this wine? Like, I mean, I could drink this right away, but because it has that higher acidity and everything, do you think you could lay it down? That's a curious question. I like, I mean, this is a new style for me and I don't drink a lot of wines like this. I really love drinking this. I don't know too much um, to be honest with you. Yeah. I would think with that acidity, it should hold pretty well. Um, and it's got so much fruit and so much concentration and great characteristic that I think it would age for, but I wouldn't, I couldn't see it getting that much better. Like the key to this wine is all that fresh fruit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, you're not gaining anything by getting secondary characteristics on this wine. So I wouldn't say you're going to have a better wine in five years. It might be more interesting and different, but yeah. I think the, the point of the wine is this fresh, vibrant kind of characteristic and um, you'll lose that when you age it for too long. So yeah. kind of for me, the drinking window would be the first couple of years but it'll still drink fantastically for five years. And then it would be kind of an interesting look into how it aged after that. I was just going to say, it sounds like we might need to conduct an experiment. So, Well, that's a great question, actually, Megan, because yeah, well, um, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah. Well, because um, uh, my past experience, um, uh, one of the, the places I worked at before, we, we did a lot of high acidity Pinot Noirs. And so um, I like to play in the cellar and, and, and find some of the old stuff. And what I found is um, high acidic light wines, they do age well. The acidity kind of acts as a preservative, but um, like what Tom was saying was the, the fresh fruit kind of goes away. And then you get a little bit more of um, like a little bit more of a prune fruit. So um, it does make for an interesting wine. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we're getting some comments about this being a breakfast wine, and I love it. I think that's also an experiment that we're going to have to try out. Yeah, dip your mimosas and have this in, for breakfast instead. That sounds great. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, besides pairing it with like fruity pebbles, what would you guys, <laughs> in terms of food, um, pair this with? Because I would go like caprese salad. I mean, of course, I'm thinking Italian, but anything also with that like high tone, high tone red sauce, you know, any any tomato sauce that has that bright acidity that's gonna like. I I was thinking like maybe um like clam chowder or something like that because you've got oh, that wow. richness from the clam chowder, you got the acidity and that freshness from the wine. Because I always look to look, I always like to look for contrast in wines. Yeah. So like, this kind of a wine with that bright acidity, I would probably eat uh, eat the um have bre uh blue cheese with it because it's got that creamy characteristic yes um you know so those sorts of things i look for the contrast like uh, if you've got an acidic wine you look for a creamy or rich kind of a food if you've got a big tannic wine you look for something to kind of balance them out yeah okay i love i love jennifer's uh suggestion which is panettone french toast okay first of all great but with a yeah. cranberry compote like that's amazing <laughs> coming over jennifer <laughs> um yes i love it so anyway it's it's really fun wine and i think this is actually a great time to talk a little bit about our new labels um we just introduced these we just launched them last month and you know it's been a long time coming we've had the same labels for the past 15 years and actually 2022 will be our 15th year anniversary, which is crazy to think about for Jacuzzi, though it's, it's been 15 years, so that's coming up, and uh, we talked to my dad, we really wanted to embrace kind of our Italian roots, this old, old school Italian vibe, and kind of balance it with this new, exciting California look as well, so we changed our labels. We worked with an amazing designer in Napa and we're super, super excited. Um, it, you'll, you'll start seeing a lot of these new labels come through. So anyway, I can kind of move on to, what was that? Oh, we just, I love the new labels and um, the different tiering and the way it's organized and the look and it's all this, it just looks really cool and really kind of grabs your eye on the show, um, to look at these wines. I thought it was awesome. And it's really cool to see the kind of four different labels 
and just having more information on them and just yeah it's cool I really like yeah it. and it's it's great because there's kind of something to discover in um each of the wine labels so you'll see our spirit wind and water uh slogan on all of the different labels you'll see uh like on the valeriano this flower is actually a flower that's grown in the area of Italy where the jacuzzis came from. So there's all these really cool ties back to our history. Uh, we really, I mean, that's something that's so important to us, which is our, our lineage and where we came from. And so kind of wanted to find something to discover in, in a little bit of all of our, uh, our labels. So it was really fun to put together. We are super, super excited to roll these out and to hope you guys are as well. Um, and really quickly, happy anniversary to Norm and Tia. They are um, happy anniversary. celebrating 24 years tomorrow. So happy anniversary. Uh, Megan, I'm pretty sure Norm might be somebody that um, uh, tasted the Valeria early on. Oh, oh, wait, um, I, this is something I need to hear about. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Norm might be the person that I had to send a uh, wine to again. <laughs> <laughs> I think I personally, I personally think Norm's a genius by putting his anniversary on Valentine's Day. He's never going to get put up. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got to go all in. I want to thank you for being so understanding, so sympathetic, and not reporting me to the idiot police. <laughs> <laughs> I can forgive you for that, but I, I can't forgive you for that jersey dorm. <laughs> do, we, do we hear, can we hear him? He probably wants to go Hawks. Go Hawks. I wish, yeah, I, I'm like, I have no idea what that jersey's for, but it's, my, <laughs> it's, it's Seahawks. Uh, Small Adams jersey, also known as Prez, and so I'm an authentic, authentic. I've been drinking some wine, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. We Go love Hawks! It. <laughs> Go Hawks. So Norm is great. He's, um, he, I, I kind of um, got to know him because he called me um, frantically, um, a week and a half ago and he was like i messed up i'm i'm in the doghouse i'm in trouble i pulled out a bottle of wine um out of the wine cooler last night and i opened it up and it turns out it was the bottle of valeriano that's for our valentine's day <laughs> tasting <laughs> and, oh, no. he, and um you know i kind of i'm not gonna lie i kind of let him sweat it out for a minute um because i knew right away i saw that he lived in washington and it was like oh we can get that to him no problem really quickly but um i kind of like he was not you know he was pretty upset about it and i kind of thought it was funny for a minute and then i was like norm i got you buddy we'll, we'll take care of it we, we got it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we are Jesse fans forever. <laughs> Thank <Awesome>. you. <laughs> Thanks, Norm. <laughs> Tina, you guys are awesome. Happy anniversary. Um, Mar Marianne and Demetrios just said that they're loving the Dolcetto with a dark chocolate. And I also have to give a big shout out to Jesse because he actually organized the wines for us and included dark chocolate in our little yeah. bag. So... I am going to be doing the same thing <laughs> right about now. Um, <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about our third wine that we have today. Um, this is our Valeriano. It's our 2018. Um, definitely one of, mm. I think, one of our most complex and interesting and really amazing wines. Um, this is kind of our take on a super Tuscan. So this is mostly, um, you know, Cabernet, you have some Sangiovese in there, hence the super Tuscan, and then a little bit, I believe, of Petit Verdot, and all of this is coming from our, let me share my screen, there we go, Cab, 62% Cab, so mostly Cabernet, Sangiovese, Malbec, Cap Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Um, so such an incredible wine. Um, 
there is a lot of structure. I think, you know, when we talk about ageability, this is a wine that you can lay down for such a long time. And it has a little bit more of that secondary characteristic. And I think it's really fun to drink right after the Dolcetto because that wine is all about the fruit and the freshness and it's so bright and vibrant. And this has a little bit more of that secondary characteristic. So you get a little bit more leather, a little bit more cooking spice and um, definitely more tannin. And it's just a little bit, it, I mean, obviously two very different styles, but um, such a unique wine and really one of my favorites. I think we included this, you know, talking about thing or Thanksgiving, God, I'm losing it. Valentine's Day dinner. This is such a good, um, like Valentine, you know, you're having this great meal. This is the wine that I would drink with like a really fancy Valentine's Day meal. So Tom, I would love to have you kind of talk us through this uh, Carneros Valeriano. Well, yeah, this um, this wine. Well, I would talk about. Uh, I decant this wine. Um, I I broke the decanter last weekend. That's a, another funny story. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the. Yeah, that's why it's in a jug. I have a decanter, but I broke it last weekend. So I'm trying to get out of the dog box. So I got my wife flowers in a decanter for Valentine's Day. So yeah, that was but, um, exactly two for one. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, I think this wine needs a decant. It's a huge, big, brooding, dark beast of a wine. And um, that just that decant will help lift the aromatics out. It'll also soften the tannins a touch and also kind of blow off some of the more, um, I guess, underripe characteristics that this wine has and evolve them into like really nice, detailed, nuanced characters like dried herbs and um, olive and stuff like that. So I fully, I know instantly with this wine, I'm going to decant it probably for the next five years. And this wine will probably last for... 10, 15, 20 years with the acidity and structure. Um, but first I got to talk about the vintage because we talked about 19 and 20. 18 was the polar opposite. It was cold, really, really cold. And this is our last pick of the harvest, full stop. Um, it's in Carneros where the grapes are growing. And um, they're grapes that only just get ripe on a good year. And in a cold, cold year in 2018, we picked this well into November and um, only just at the cusp of ripeness. But that's perfect. That's how you make the best wine. Um, you want to hang it out for as long as possible, but not get overripe and not be underripe. And just hanging it out there for a long time gave us all this wonderful flavor. It's just a gorgeous, detailed, nuanced wine that is just awesome to drink. And um, really, really glad you guys get to enjoy it and proud to show it to you guys. Um, so yeah, like I said, we had, uh, I think the first week of October, we had about two inches of rain, which is unheard of in California. That's a lot of rain. Unfortunately, our vineyards are in great shape and um, we've got light canopies and we open up the bunch zone. So we didn't get any mold or mildew or anything like that, which was awesome, but it was kind of one of those brave decisions to hang your grapes out because a lot of people panicked when they saw that rain coming along. So we just kind of hung those grapes out. We trusted that our viticulture was great and that our vineyards were in great shape and um, managed to hang it out there for an extra month, which just gives you all this nuance. You've got wonderful characteristics. There's plenty of fruit in there. There's blackberry, plum, cranberry, boysenberry, all sorts of things. It's got that nice dried herb, green olive characteristics, some really nice oak in there as well. Um, so yeah, like Megan was saying, this is, so this is mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. It's 62% Cabernet Sauv. Um, it's got 16% uh, Sangiovese. So we got a couple of roses of Sangiovese that goes into this. Um, and then we got some Malbec, a couple of blocks of Malbec and a little bit of Cab Franc. And on a good year, we get a little bit of Petit Verdot, which gives it real big structure and also a lot of color. So a really fun wine. We use all five Bordeaux varieties in it and then Sangiovese, which gives us our super Tuscan. So if you're familiar with the wines of Bulgari, um, basically Italy's really governed by what you can and can't grow everywhere, apart from this place called Bulgari, where they brought over the French varieties and started making these super Tuscan wines that are very, very hard to find. Very, yeah. So it's our, our take on that. And um, it's this wine's awesome. And yeah, I was, trust me, when we were tasting this in barrel, I was a little bit worried about it because it had some of those kind of greenish notes, undertones, but um, this is just boss blossoming into a fantastic, fantastic wine. Um, yeah, we put it into new oak. I uh, got about 40% new French oak and um, spent two, two years almost, I think, in barrel to help soften those tannins. We give it a couple of wrecks. Um, this wine, we spent, it's been about two weeks on skins, you know, compared to the Dolcetto, which spins five. So you get a lot more skin contact. And moving forward with the new styles, we'll be putting even more skin contact on as well, going for like 
three to four weeks as well to get bigger, bolder wines. We want this to be our biggest flagship wine and um, it's doing that right now. It's fantastic. So we're really, really happy with this. Yeah. Jesse, I would love to hear what you think. Oh, uh, so this is a really fun wine. I, I like it a lot because I um, have always been a big fan of um, the big wines that are a little different, like Cab Franc, Petit Verdot. Um, so I really like the, the green olive that comes through on this one. Um, it, and, you know, it's, it's a heavier wine, but it's not, um, you know, it, it doesn't come at you too crazy, like maybe like, a, you know, a really heavy Napa Cab or something. So um, I just feel like you can, I can drink this without food. I know it goes better with food, but I can still drink it without it. Uh, and uh, that's why I like, I love the new label on it too. Um, uh, it, it's fun. I feel like it, it kind of um, depicts the wine. Yeah. I would say like out of all of the wines that we make, this is, this really calls back to that old world style. Like, like yes. you were saying, it really has yeah, that secondary kind of herbaceous character. And um, I think, yeah, would really stand up to a lot of those super Tuscans, those Bulgari, uh, Sassicaia. Like, I think it is really in that same vein. And um, I think you did such an amazing job. It is a wine that will age for a long time. You can eat it with food. This, this is definitely a wine that I would have, like I was saying, with some of those bigger, like, cuts of meat or something that's just a little bit hardier that can stand up to this wine with the bigger tannin and yeah ribeye um so my friend norm um he would say um what goes well with valeriano is another bottle of valeriano <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that was good that was good jesse um oh so we did get a couple questions about asking where the name came from and then was that a photo of valeriano your grandfather question mark um so valeriano was actually my great grandfather so he was my dad's grandfather and that was a photo of him and that is where the name comes from he was the one who taught my dad everything about winemaking and grape growing. Um, you know, obviously, jacuzzi, the history is there. It's all about your modern day hot tub. My great grandfather was really more on the agriculture side. So he had a ranch out in Oakley, out in Contra Costa County. He was the one who would make wine for the entire extended family. And then when he passed, that became my dad's job. So um, he was definitely more on the agricultural side, but and yeah, I, this is just a wine that's really a tribute to him and all he has done. And, and really Jacuzzi as a whole is uh, a tribute to him and you know the innovation that came with that family. And um, anyway, it's, it's been so fun to work at Jacuzzi. Like Tom was saying, work with these really crazy varieties that you don't really see a whole lot of other places. I Have any of you guys had dolcettos from other places? Like before I came back to work with my family, I don't think I had ever had a dolcetto or a Tiraldigo for sure. So it's been super fun working with these crazy varieties and learning a little bit more about them and really like paying homage to that are like Italian uh, history. Oh. Yeah, I think I like it as well because it's, um, and it, you spoke about it a little bit with the labels. It's the California take on Italy, and um, it's a lot of fun to do this and make these wines and share them with you guys. So, yeah. Yeah, and please, if you guys have any questions, drop them in the chat. We would love to hear what you think of Valeriano. Do you guys like this wine? Do you want to age it for a little bit longer? Uh, we have a note from Becky. They're from Massachusetts. Oh, you were planning on getting married at Jacuzzi in April. Of course, COVID killed that. Sorry. Uh, virtual wine tasting it is. Enjoying it with flourless chocolate. I actually have been eating this dark chocolate on the side. It goes great with, um, with the Valeriano. And 
think this one needs to open up more. Yeah, I, I love the idea of decanting this. I didn't decant mine. And I think that that aeration would really help bring out, a, like maybe soften those tannins a little bit. Yeah, and it kind of just changes the aromatic profile a little bit, um, kind of really kind of makes it blossom and kind of melds it all together as well. This wine is, I mean, the way we grow it and um, kind of just picking it at that edge of ripeness and the way we make it as well, um, just really kind of leans into, um, we're, we're growing these grape varieties right on the edge of where they can be grown. And so in a cold vintage like 18, to get it ripe and to get it to taste like this, this wine's going to be it's gonna be really hard to make a better wine than this because we just got all those elements right and just right on the edge. When you get closer to the edge of rightness, um, that's when real magic happens and you can make some fantastic, fantastic wines. And this is this is an awesome example. It's really cool to be able to make this kind of wine. Um, we got a question from Greg about uh, if the fire affected jacuzzi at all. And um, Tom, I would love to have you talk about that since you're you know in the vineyard and in the winery every day. But I know we have. It's been very scary, especially the past couple of years with yeah, the which fire. fire. <laughs> yeah. um, no, um, it's the fires have been um, a challenge, is a polite way of putting it. Um, so we're we're down in Carneros, um, for those of you who haven't visited in Carneros, and um, so we're a bit further away from the fires, but um, definitely smoke impact and stuff like that were worries. Um, twenty twenty was by far the worst year for smoke impact worries. Um, the fires started about three months earlier. Normally when the fires start in California, and that's a terrible thing to say normally when the fires start, but anyway, um, that's normally in October. Um, and most of the grapes are picked by then, but this year they started in August when we're only just starting to pick the grapes. And so you've got a lot more problems when that happens. You've got more higher smoke impact problems. Um, from a winery standpoint as well, PG&E, rather than cause fires and get a lawsuit, um, they'll shut the power off. And so we've got generators, backup generators and stuff like that. We have to decrease our processing facility and stuff like that because we can't use as much power. We just don't have the logistics when they shut the power off to do things. Um, 2020, they didn't shut off the power. 2019, they shut off the power two or three times, I think, um, for like three or four days. And um, people quickly scrambled and figured it out and whatnot. But um, those were challenges. The smoke taint jacuzzi, we came through cl uh, clean on 2020, which is great. So 2020 is the big smoke problem. Um, we're, we're further south down the valley, further away from the fires. So smoke impact is all based upon um, how, well, it's not about how close you are to the fire, it's how quickly the smoke gets to you. So um, the smoke's got to be fresh. So within the first, within 12 hours of burning. So what happened, I, I can get way more technical, I won't, but um, sorry. But uh, if, it's, if the smoke's getting to your vineyard within 12 hours, um, like from the fire to the, to the vineyard within 12 hours, those compounds can get stuck on the grape skins and can actually end up in your wine. So that's um, that was a that could be a problem. But because we're so far away from the fires in 2020, we didn't have too many problems. We had slightly elevated numbers. We were checking it um, with numerous labs and cross-checking it and stuff like that. Um, we had slightly elevated, but nothing to um, affect the flavor of the wine. So we're really, really lucky about that. So, um, but yeah, no, definitely, yeah, every year presents new challenges and every year we learn more stuff and um, we get better at making wine, which is really cool. Okay, we, we have some questions, and I also have a question that I meant to ask for the Dolcetto, and I'll, I'll save that, so Tom, get ready. Um, <laughs> I can't get ready unless you tell me it. Oh, yeah, well, okay, <laughs> hold on. Um, someone asked if we will have more wine tastings in the future, and yes, we did take a mini hiatus for Jacuzzi, but we are going to continue doing these every single month. It's been super fun for us, um, even though, you know, we finally, finally opened Jacuzzi back up, our stay at home, home orders have been lifted. So that is great. We are open for tastings for anyone who is around the area, but we love the virtual events. Like for us, it's really fun to actually see new faces, especially people who don't get to come to the winery uh, every week or every month. So Absolutely. We're going to keep doing this even when we are fully open, all the restrictions are lifted. This, I think, has been a silver lining of the COVID uh, situation that we get to connect with people from all over. So we, we really enjoy it. We're going to keep it going. And Tom, my question is, San Antonio Valley, from there. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and how we found this Dolcetto? 
Uh, sorry, I you cut out a little bit. Oh. Uh, San Antonio Valley. Oh, San Antonio Valley. Can we talk um, yeah, about so there's, there's, there's a, not a lot of uh, dolcetto grown out there. Um, yeah, it's really, really hard to find. Um, San Antonio Valley is kind of like uh, just south of Santa Cruz. Um, so south of San Francisco in between um, Los Angeles and um, San, San Francisco. Um, it's uh, basically we're Big Sur. Is. It's just on the, the inland, like the hill over from Big Sur. And so very, very cold climate, coastal climate, and um, just some really cool grapes. We've got, we just put our feelers out there asking if anybody had Dolcetto and we just happened to stumble across this grower. Um, great vineyard, really cool. Um, this was, this Dolcetto is picked a little bit earlier. Earlier, um, We picked it kind of mid August. And, um, but we like that because it's got that freshness and that vibrancy. It's closer to the coast and um, it's got great acidity and the flavor really pops on it. And I'm really genuinely impressed. It's my first grapes that I've worked with San Antonio Valley, so I'm still learning. Um, but I really, really like what it's done to this wine with all that fresh flavor. And um, that's probably an evolution that Jesse seemed to like as well from the 19 to the 20. And um, just a really cool, cool yeah. place. Um, super easy guys to work with. Vineyard looked great and um, just felt right. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's so cool because, yeah, I saw it on the label and I was like, I know we've never gotten fruit from there before. Um, so really fun. Where where were the past vintages from? Mendocino? Mendocino, yep. Yeah, we had to grow up there, but um, that just wasn't going to work out in 2020. Um, he had other plans for those grapes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but I'm um, super found, great, we, grateful that we found the Dolcetto and um, the wine tastes great. So um, we'll be probably keeping with that vineyard and keeping with those guys. Yeah. Um, Tom, do you know what the legal ID card is in New, in New Zealand? Uh, <laughs> legal ID card? Um, so in New Zealand, you can drink when you're 18. Um, so generally driver's licenses. Why? That's a weird question. But um, yeah. No, <laughs> Sorry. Frodo is Frodo ID. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, oh, I got you. Thank you, for Norm and Tia. Oh, jeez. Um, oh, this, this is a great question from Greg. What is your favorite German wine? Um, so I worked in Germany and I worked for a fantastic producer. So my favorite German wine, it's too expensive for my, for me to take. I've only ever got to try it like a couple of times. Um, but generally speaking, dry German Riesling, um, from the Na or the Rheinhessen is my favorite or the Rheingau as well. Um, that's kind of what we drink a lot at home, um, dry German Riesling. And uh, we drink some sweet stuff every now and again, but that's kind of more like a, a dessert thing. But um, dry German Riesling is awesome. Um, specifically, I've got a couple of producers in the Rheinhessen, Find Good Keller and um, Bittman. Very hard to find, but like I search it out and I really love dry German Riesling. It's my favorite. Keller I had is a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Keller is where you worked? Is that yeah, right? Keller was where I worked. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, that was an awesome experience. Um, working, the, his winemaking was a uh, little bit different from most of the stuff that happens over here in California. For starters, they've been farming the same plots of land for 200 years. So they know all the weather patterns and they just kind of like, oh, this year is like this year. Whereas California, we haven't been farming the land for that long, apart from the Jacuzzi family, been farming for over 100 years, but in different spots. And um, so we're still kind of learning about um, the terrain and all the rest of it. And a lot of our vineyards are still pretty young. The other thing about it over there, um, oh, geez, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, it was just different. Oh, working with the winemaker, the winemaker spent a lot of time in the vineyard. And when he wanted things done properly, he was out there doing it himself as well. So just that kind of vineyard focus. If you're focusing on your vineyard, generally the winery side becomes a lot easier. Yeah, Tom, and you're so good at that. I mean, Tom has really been my mentor in terms of winemaking and grape growing. And he was like, okay, that means you have to go out to the vineyard and drop fruit if you want, <laughs> if you want this certain concentration or you have to go out there. And I mean, so I think you, you've learned a lot and have brought a lot of that to the winemaking at Jacuzzi. So good on you. Oh, no, thanks. It's, it's important. The vine uh, yeah. Um, the wine, there's a philosophy in most of the world. Um, once the grapes get into the winery, get to the winery, the uh, winemaker can only screw it up um you know yep. your grapes are only as good as you know the winemaker can do things and all the rest of it but generally if you've got fantastic grapes um it's a winemaker's job to translate that into a fantastic wine not to create a fantastic wine out of bad grapes yeah, yeah. okay really quickly guys um which one of these wines do you think would go best with lobster 
uh, I would say the dolcetto or the risotto mostly, um, mainly because if you're like me, you drench your lobster in butter and uh, cut through all that butter. Um, the dolcetto and the primitivo, they're probably the primitivo risotto because it won't overwhelm that delicate lobster flavor, um, but the acidity will cut through the butter. And um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's kind of what I, I would do. Yeah, I, I would say either one of those is a good call. Depends on what you want to drink. I, I, I'm a little bit of a philosophy. If you want to drink it, drink it and eat what you want to eat. Hey, Sorry. Jesse, can you get a couple of those bottles to us by tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> it might take a couple more days than that. I, I'll, I'll have them to you by Tuesday or Wednesday, though. I don't know. Tia's cooking the lobster tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. Right? Yeah. So anyway, you guys, I first of all want to thank you all so much for being here. It's nice to connect again after so long and see some new faces. And um, we always have so much fun during these virtual events. And I also want to say a happy Valentine's Day. I hope you guys have something fun planned, maybe some more lobster or, you know, whatever it is. I am going to be hanging out with my dog probably watching Netflix all day, which sounds like my perfect Valentine's Day. Um, and so anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your weekend and um, hope to see you next month. We will be doing this monthly. So we'll send out another invite for our next uh, virtual tasting. And we hope to see you then. We're also open at Jacuzzi. So if you're around, please come visit us. We would love to see you. And um, yeah, just yeah. I'd, I'd love to just chime in real quick. Yeah. Um, I just want to say hi to all of you again. Um, I was like flipping through looking at everybody's names. And it's just it was a lot of fun because like I recognize a lot of the names because I've talked to a lot of you. And it's just kind of fun, you know, to put a, a, a face to the name. Um, and I hope you guys had a good time. I know you did, Norm. Go Hawks! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Oh, did you have, the, yeah. did you have the chocolate with the uh, Bellariano as well? Or did they eat it all before they got to that? Go oh, Broncos, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she told me to go on mute. Bye. <laughs> okay, oh. really quickly, I already binge watched Bridgerton. It was so good. Oh that, my gosh. Dan said binge watch it. Okay, amazing. I totally agree. I love it. The guys will roll their eyes and the girls are like, yay. Oh my God, yay. I can't wait for season two. I'm ready. <laughs> it's so good. Um, great, you guys. Well, have a wonderful Valentine's Day. We hope to, we hope to see you soon and um, enjoy. Thank, Thank you, you so all. Much. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us and have a great weekend. Thank you so Bye. much. Man.